Hi, I'm Mark Turrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to the Power of Questions of the best solution-focused questions for getting stuck clients moving again. Now, uh, Claude Levi Strauss said, the wise man doesn't give the right answers, he poses the right questions. And here's a question. When is a question more than a question? When it's a reframe, when it's an invitation to inner focus, when it's a presupposition to positive change, a way of clarifying your client's real needs and a precursor to hypnotic trance. One tool can have many uses. Assuming a question is only a way of eliciting information is akin to using an iPad as a doorstop. Yes, it works that way, but it can do so much more. For example, Socratic questioning has been found to be effective for depression because the answers it can produce widen our vision beyond the narrowness of a problematic perception. It takes us out of the depressive biases in our thinking. So what can a well-put and well-timed question do other than simply extract factual information? Not all questions need to be, or indeed can be, answered in the way that they're posed. What's it going to be like, I wonder, for you to feel that amazing sensation for the very first time? Sure, the person can try to answer through guesstimation, but the real answer to such a question comes through experience, not words. Okay, but you're opening them up to that experience through asking a question like that. A question or a series of questions can be used as a conversational invitation to go inward on an inner search to experience insight during light or deeper therapeutic trance. And will it be, I wonder, your left or your, or your right hand that begins to notice that deepening comfort first? What does it feel like to feel that good, I wonder? And I wonder whether you can notice that feeling or something of it again now or maybe in a few moments. And when I wonder, will you notice that first full night's sleep? A question like that also does something else powerful. Positive expectation is a hugely powerful human resource. 80% of Prozac's efficiency or efficacy is attributable to its consumer's belief in it. Check out reference to of, of the article. Rumination with hope mitigates the usually depressing effects of rumination without hope. Older people with negative beliefs about aging are significantly more likely to develop dementia than those who embrace their senior years with more positivity. Expectation matters, which means that how much your client believes in their own therapeutic potential may, makes an actual difference to that potential. You and I need to be able to engender hope as part of therapy in our clients. Therapists and coaches and practitioners of all kinds should be skilled in uh, maximizing hope. But crucially, we need to do this in a way that doesn't cause them, the, the client to automatically resist crass positivity. So how do we do that? Well, with well-designed questions. So questions can be carriers of hope. They can smuggle it in without the client even realizing it and without them having the chance to resist it. Positivity, or perhaps just greater realism, can be made digestible through a question which can simultaneously expand horizons, produce useful information, and subtly engender positive expectation. So we can ask about a better future. We might say something like, you know, what will the greatest change be in your life, do you suppose, once you get rid of those panic attacks once and for all? What are you most looking forward to? A question like that implies, as a given, that your client has the capacity to overcome the anxiety episodes, but then, like a conjurer's trick, simply gets the client to focus elsewhere so they don't have time to reject the positive idea that they can get rid of the panic attacks. The question isn't whether or not they can come to control the panic, but what will be the greatest thing about not panicking? The question asks about the greatest thing, so there's a further implication that there will be other good things too that the person can enjoy. Just like that, we've reframed the problem. If you're interested in learning more about this crucial technique, I've written a whole book about reframing and, and ran an online course on conversational reframing. So questions are a natural aspect of conversation. And if you never ask other people questions during normal conversations, 
where you might want to look at that as well. So asking your clients questions is not in itself going to sound alarm bells in their head or make them resist because it's a very open way of communicating. But the question, of course, can deliver a suggestion. But slowly and surely it's helping them build an internal model of what life could be like beyond a problem. Clients need to know where they need to go because just maybe they've gotten into the habit of merely focusing on what they don't want. So this is a start, but if you're traveling someplace, you need to at least have an idea of where you do want to go, not just where you don't want to go. Solution-focused questions can help build psychological templates of how to be and what to do. And good questions can also do something else miraculous. So a client of mine, Samantha, uh, came along and uh, Samantha's line manager was always criticizing her work and Samantha felt unable to stand up for herself. And I asked her what her line manager might be most afraid of. And Samantha said, gosh, you know, I'd never thought of it like that. You know, I've been thinking about my own fear of her. So instantly we have a reframe, a wider view simply from a question. Okay, it's a question, but it reframes something. The reframe helps Samantha start seeing the manager differently and was a precursor to her finding the calm to actually stick up for herself more, which she did uh, with good effect. Now, of course, maybe the line manager wasn't particularly afraid of anything. Maybe she was a self-confident narcissist, but that's not the point. The point is the question helped Samantha start to see things in a wider way. Likewise, asking someone who's been through some really tough times about the main things they learned from those experiences also helps widen their frame of reference and implies that perhaps it wasn't all wasted time. So you see how the reframe can be carried in a question. Even a simple compliment can be a reframe if the receiver of the sincere compliment has never seen themselves in that way before. And questions are the perfect way to carry those compliments. We know that people with low self-esteem can feel almost insulted by a compliment because it jars so disrespectfully with their reality, with their belief system, their ideology about themselves. But a question can smuggle a compliment inside itself. So when you were brave enough to say that, how did they react? Okay. Or, so she didn't respond well to your good intentions. Or, where else could you apply your creativity, do you think? Notice the focus of the questions distracts somewhat from the inferred compliment, which is delivered as an unexamined given of the situation. A well-crafted question can help a client separate their core identity from the problem without laboring the idea. You are not it, and it is not you. Some questions act to remove the difficult emotional pattern from the client's core identity, as well as reframing it. How does that anger try to get you to do things you really don't want to be doing? Or, when you've left that depression behind, what will you be doing more of in your life? Or, what lies does that impulse to drink try to con you with on those occasions? We can thereby help our clients amplify their sense of possibility as a being who is much larger than the problem. Questions of this kind can help clients transcend their labels without the usual platitudes of, you are not your anger. Okay. Clients' answers to these kinds of questions can also elicit good material to work with therapeutically. Okay, so that was a rather incomplete summary of what questions can do, but I hope it conveyed some of the power of therapeutic questioning. And here are 17 really useful solution-focused questions. Okay that I'll just sort of randomly pump out here. So number one, what improvements have you noticed since booking the appointment to see me and coming along today? It's amazing how often clients report they've felt more positive or slept better or felt a little calmer since making the appointment to see you. If this is the case, then therapy has already started for them even before they see you. We need to know what's different. Often it's the addition of new hope and we need to build on the pre-session momentum. But we might miss that altogether if we don't ask it. Okay. Number two, if a miracle occurred tonight as you slept and tomorrow the problem was no longer there, what would be different? And that's you know, the good old miracle question. It's 
so familiar with coaches and therapists. There are many variations of the miracle question and they all go something like this. If a miracle occurred tonight as you slept and in the morning the problem was no longer there, what would life be like? What will be different? What will, be, what will you be doing differently? The client is encouraged to let go of limiting ideas like that could never happen because after all this is simply a thought experiment. But it can show us, and more importantly them, what they need and want from therapy. Number three, what times have there been when the problem didn't happen when you might have expected it to happen? So it's natural to ask questions about the problem, but we discover so much good therapeutic material from, make, from asking about when it hasn't happened and why not. The client often hasn't thought about this. You know, the client often knows deep down how to avoid the problem. We just have, have to help them discover that. So when did you notice that you just weren't nervous or sad or whatever, when you normally ex would have expected to be? Then, how did you do that? What were you doing differently? What was happening differently? And the answers can be therapeutic gold. Number four, how will you know when you no longer need to come and see me? We can shape goals through this question. We can create a scaffold on which to build therapy. Maybe the answer is when I feel strong enough to X, Y, Z, or when I can sleep through the night and worry much less. So we're also indicating that therapy is temporary we're supplying a service for a limited time, the implication being that this problem will not last forever. The client's answers also serve as a handy point of reference to assess the client's progress and success once therapy is done. Number five, what would we see if we watched a video of you doing your problem? We might ask this jokingly, but we can persist with it because it can produce useful nuggets. This type of question helps the client start to see the problem from the outside and therefore strengthens the observing self. And it can also give us valuable information as to the steps or stages of the problem behavior, which may be useful when we help disrupt unhelpful patterns. Number six, what will be the first small change you'll notice once that depression has started to lift? So depression and other high stress conditions drive absolutist or extremist thinking, all or nothing thinking. The client will describe their reality in terms of all or nothing statements. And you might hear them use terms such as totally or completely or always or disaster or perfect or never and so forth. Once we calm clients down, their thinking will tend to become more moderate naturally. But we can also ask questions that require more nuanced thinking. So rather than I will be happy or I won't have any problems, which are absolutist statements, the question uh, might elicit a style of thinking that's not typically depressive. I'll start to feel a little more hopeful in the mornings or I'll start to see at least my best friend a little more. So a variation on this question would be what one small difference in your day would make things better? Okay, number seven, on a scale of one to ten. We can use scaling in therapy for so many different issues from pain or to traumatic feelings and grading the level of a problem can help the client do less absolutist thinking. So on a scale of one to 10, one being the saddest and 10 being the happiest, where are you today? Where were you yesterday? This question takes us away from the all or nothing absolutist thinking, takes off the perfectionistic pressure to be totally cured, gives us clues as to what small thing we can work towards next and can also give us material for the next question, which might be, um, what stops you? If, say, someone rates their level of happiness as a four today, you might say, okay, what stops you being a three today or lower? And they might say, well, I saw my neighbor this morning and they were really sweet, or I feel a bit better being here with you talking, or I, I generally feel a bit better on Fridays because work is finished for the week. So they're giving you valuable information about what they need in their life and giving you a chance to see more clearly the cause of their problems. Number nine, what will you be doing differently when this problem has been resolved? So of course, human beings aren't just thinking or emoting creatures, we, we do, we behave. Some clients have never thought about the reality of not having their problem in the future as well. Clients may become so wrapped up in their heads and focused on feelings that they forget that a life lived is also made up of actions. So we can ask them about the future once the problem has gone. 
You know, for instance, what will you be doing with the extra hours once the obsessive compulsive disorder has been kicked out for good? Okay, suddenly the person with, without the problem has all this extra time. What will you do day to day once you've left that depression behind? What are you going to be doing differently? What will your day look like? What will you do in the evenings once you no longer have to drink three bottles of wine? Okay, so we get a sense of what the client might need more of in their life and also help create a template in the mind, an expectation of the reality of life beyond the problem. Question 10, what will other people notice in you? This question helps the client get a sense of seeing things from the outside to see wider and further. They might say something like, uh, they'd see me smiling more, or they'd see a spring in my step, or they'd see me get on with things, okay, actually doing stuff, or they'd see me making jokes again, because normally I'm, I'm funny and, and uh, I love humour, and uh, they'd see that in me. So it can be useful to go from asking someone this question to asking them to enter hypnotic trance and start to see themselves in that preferred way, in that preferred future, looking how they have just described. And from there, it's not such a big step to feeling those preferred feelings and then doing those preferred actions. We could also ask question number 11, who will notice these improvements first? And this again helps the client see themselves from outside their own limited perspective. They might quite enjoy thinking about just who will first notice their positive changes. One client told me, it sounds weird, but I think my dog will notice my improved mood first, as I'll be more responsive to him. And also the postman, because I've always, I always used to chat with him and I haven't done that in a while. Okay. Question number 12, what other parts of your life will be helped as you overcome this problem? So problems have ripple effects, but so do solutions. We might ask this question and find that the community as a whole will benefit, or their finances will benefit, or their physical health will benefit, and so forth. Question 13, what will be the best aspect of? So again, this implies multiple knock-on benefits. The best aspect of coming out of a depression might be to feel better, obviously, but once they've told you that, you can ask them all about other benefits as well. What will be the best aspect of sleeping better? What will be the best aspect of controlling the drinking? So the number of potential answers is endless. You know, better concentration, better social life, more exercise, and so on. Question 14, if you were someone else who really loves you, what would you say to yourself about what you really need? And this could be a real person who has, or has had, if the person is no longer living, your client's best interests at heart. Or it could be an abstract person. So this thought experiment can also be a gateway into inner work in which your client could imagine listening to the words of someone who can really help define what they need, which might include giving themselves less of a hard time or more self-respect. Question 15, can a person make mistakes but still be basically a good person? So this is a very useful question for someone who feels they're a bad person, for example, they're really down on themselves. Or for someone who has described themselves as stupid, we might ask, can a smart person still sometimes do stupid things? And these are prime examples of Socratic questioning and can really help to diminish over-reliance on depressive uh, extremist absolutist thinking. Uh, question 16, where do you find the strength to? So this might seem slightly negative as though we are inferring that they need so much strength to cope with their problems, but I found it really useful as a way of eliciting resources from clients. Where do you find the strength to get up and go to work every day, even though you've been feeling that bad? And they might tell you they do it because they don't want to let others down. And that tells you something instructive about their value system or because they have to earn money to support the children that they love so much. And that tells you about their capacity for love and duty. So where is your client's source of strength? Despite things being difficult, how do they still manage to do stuff? And finally, question 17, what might go wrong and how would you deal with that? Now this might, might seem like a really negative question, but it can offset despair if things get better, then retrograde a bit, you know, after all, 
you prepared them for this and give them the chance to tell you what they need and anything you haven't yet addressed, which perhaps you can address now. For example, one woman I asked this question of told me, well, you know, if my co-worker shouts at me again, I'm worried I might go back to square one and just start binging. So we worked on her becoming more assertive with this garrulous co-worker and that was another therapeutic win. Asking people how they might deal with an unexpected setback gives them a chance to prepare for it, lets them know it need not be the end of the world and hands them some responsibility. And question of questions, in coaching or teaching or therapy, we might always be aware that a question can also be an invitation to change, to see new perspectives, to widen our view on something. In fact, really good questions will have all these benefits. We can imply something by questions and in so doing smuggle a sincere compliment or positive expectation past the rigid rocks of uh, fossilized negativity. And a good question can also build rapport, you know, keeping it real for them. If I ask someone who's acting out of a strong negative bias about their mood, I may turn them off and break rapport if I seem too clashingly upbeat, you know, sort of clashing with their ideology. I could ask them, when do you feel happier? But their psychology as it stands doesn't respond to positives. Okay, but they might respond to the same question if couched in different terms. They may simply shut the question down with a resounding, I never feel happier. But I could ask the same question in a way that connects with their perception. When do you feel the worst? Now, I've asked a question which can sit squarely within their negative frame of reality, yet is in a, in a way the same question as the jarringly positive one. If they tell me that Monday mornings are the worst, then what they've also implied is that other times are better, that Tuesday mornings are better than Monday mornings. We might then go on to explore what's different about Tuesday mornings, not better, but different. We can retain rapport, but still go down a solution-orientated positive pathway without being too obnoxiously positive. We use questions to, con to connect uh, to our clients' current realities as a way of starting to lead them gently to wider and healthier viewpoints. But the importance of asking good questions goes way beyond therapy. Perhaps too, the quality of our own lives ultimately equates to the depth and sincerity of the questions we ask of life and of ourselves. So I hope you found that useful. And if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Terrell of Uncommon Knowledge. And if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com slash blog, that's unk.com slash blog, and thanks for watching as always. Thank you.